Welcome to um, the next session, which is on reshaping um, user experiences with virtual reality and AI. Uh, I thought it might be useful just to uh, kick off by saying very quickly uh, something about the terms uh, virtual reality, um, uh, AI, uh, and augmented reality. Um, so virtual reality has been developing since, since the 70s. Um, and it's really about offering people total immersion in a different environment, uh, often uh, using a, a headset at the moment, but that probably will change in the, the future as well. Um, augmented reality, uh, it offers um, people uh, more information uh, based on the reality that they're experiencing. And it's really about enhancing that physical experience that people are having. Um, and AI uh, is, uh, well, it's been developing uh, since the 1950s. Um, and uh, it's, uh, you can largely group it into uh, things to do with text. Um, so machine learning, supervised and unsupervised methods. Uh, and also a big area is uh, computer vision. And there's obviously a lot of hype about around AI um, but today we're talking about uh, some real applications of the technology, so it's quite practically uh, uh, informed by practice, uh, which will be nice to hear about. The first presentation uh, its title is Non-Human Narratives Using Multimedia and AI to Investigate Collections. It was presented by Stephanie Moran, Alexander Hogan and Beth Hogan of Etic Labs uh, at the University of Plymouth. Um, Etic Lab is a research and design consultancy based in Mid Wales, and Alex has been working with data for 20 years with expertise in artificial intelligence and novel data technologies. Stephanie has had over a decade's experience in arts project leadership and librarianship, and Beth has a background um, as a much sought after consultant organising large scale arts uh, events. Um, if you'd like to start the presentation now, that would be great. Uh, thank you, Peter, for your introduction, and thank you, everyone, for your time today. Um, the three of us are going to try to use these 15 minutes to give you a taste of some of the work on non-human narratives enabled through and by digital technologies that we at Estet Lab have produced over the last decade, and hopefully into the future. Um, I'd like to start by sharing some of the machine-to-human interactions that a uh, political bot exhibit um, that we built about five years ago now, was able to have over a period of about six months and 5,000 conversations. Uh, the political bot was made for the Victoria and Albert Museum's 2018 exhibition, The Future Starts Here. And it was based on about two years worth of research to produce as a collaboration between Etit Lab and Oxford University's Internet Institute into how automation on the internet had been exploited for political propaganda purposes. I think the exhibition's curators probably hoped I could give them uh, something they could present as having been used to win some awkward elections around 2016, uh, or at least demonstrate the ability to persuade people in a way I had no evidence or experience of having ever happened. Uh, but I don't have any problem with them hoping to find that. Um, indeed, new technologies have only really been successful insofar as they've been able to position themselves as magical solutions and not just to individual dilemmas, but the bigger crisis and dysfunctions of our world. Uh, we were asked to build it with various functions that allowed it to become uh, an interactive exhibit. So we had to broadcast onto Twitter and other platforms uh, information about the exhibition. We had to start conversations about the exhibition's topics, with targeted influencers, and uh, we had to promote the opinions of audience members. Uh, one of its functions, which was insisted on by the curators, but which was perhaps something of a diversion from traditional activities of political bots uh, that we'd found in the wild with a chat feature. Uh, we based that on a 50-year-old programme that was designed to keep the conversation rolling without providing definitive statements that would take the conversation beyond the limitations of its code. Uh, I initially thought it would be a, a cute feature that listed maybe one or two tweets before being ignored. And that did indeed happen a lot. Um, but what I hadn't anticipated and struck me when I was going back over the conversations was the wide range of expectations that people brought with them when they started talking to the bot. Uh, it was really wonderful for me knowing what was under the hood and how I expected it to work 
uh, to see it used and exposed in ways I hadn't anticipated. Uh, watching it meet or fail to meet uh, people's criteria for what is a bot. Uh, as it was advertised as political, it unsurprisingly elicited a lot of political commentary. It had questions about who people should vote for, uh, who it thought would win various elections, about what it thought of Donald Trump. Uh, these seemed pretty popular and uh, I think interestingly could be easily anticipated and programmed for, um, if not by me then some other bot designer in the world. I think trust was a particularly salient point to raise. Along with political issues, our bot was asked uh, why the people it spoke to were too fat, if it could help make someone fall in love with someone, uh, and what they should have for lunch. It made me curious to the extent to which a bot might be trusted with a direct answer to such questions, especially given that other research we performed suggested that di a direct bot, which was upfront about its intentions and who it was, can often be more successful in recruiting to activist causes than something trying to be more human. Um, sometimes the questions it was asked assumed an omnipotence that was thoroughly undeserved. Um, it was asked obscure questions that would require a lot of prior knowledge of a subject, or even the kind of introspection that would be difficult for a human, uh, or at least me. Um, one audience member tried to hold a theological debate with the bot, and ended it only when it decided that the bot was offering him nothing new. Sometimes people wouldn't let it go when the bot didn't live up to their expectations. Uh, the conversation defended and descended into argument or complaints. Its English was poor or that the people were bored when it stopped having opinions. Uh, there were people who tried to test it. At least one issued it a Turing test, which it failed. Uh, others tried to ask it to demonstrate abilities that they knew bots should have. Uh, maybe I'm reading too much into these conversations, but I swear sometimes that there was a kind of intellectual jousting going on, or at least the very desire to prove that the bot wasn't as sophisticated as they knew it should be. In the wild, builders and users of political bots are constantly revising their creations, uh, not least in response to new restrictions implemented by platforms. I think it might be nice to go back to this project, uh, particularly with fresh eyes as to what people want from political propaganda. There's also a lot of new technology out there that would be able to inject some of the more outlandish talents that were ascribed to it the first time around. Presumably, even it won't be too long until something like this is a project of a museum of the past and our, as its descendants will rule over our high tech future. I'd like now to hand over to my colleague who has greater experience with the more specifically non human digital narratives. So, Stephanie, take it away. Thanks. Um, so, I'm going to talk about three current projects we're working on with museums and collections. Uh, the first one of these, um, ISCRI, uh, which stands for Interspecies Communication Research Initiative. Uh, so this is a project that uh, we're working in partnership with the Serpentine Galleries Creative AI Lab in London. Uh, this was a pre-existing collaboration between Etic Lab uh, and an artist collective called Orphan Drift. Um, and we turned Orphan Drift's um, original question, what if AI was based on an octopus rather than a human consciousness? into the question of how to use artwork to invite an octopus to communicate with us. And the Serpentine joined as project partners um, about a year and a half ago. So they were interested in the back end, they still are interested in the back end, how the AI works, um, sort of demystifying or understanding what's going on. Uh, but we're interested in that, but also in learning from another animal in its environment, uh, rather than a, a human curated data set. Um, so we're interested in using visual, tactile communication, uh, artworks to invite a response. Uh, we'll be prototyping this summer our proof of concept uh, of communicating how, how we can uh, communicate, use an AI to communicate with another animal um, based on Welsh birds in their environment. That will be the first step um, in a very big uh, uh, AI build project. Uh, the second project I want to mention is um, a project, a three-month uh, research fellowship I did uh, earlier this year at the Smithsonian's uh, National Museum of Natural History, working with research zoologists in the invertebrate zoology department um, to try and tell the story of a collection from the perspective of the animals it represents. 
in this case, another mollusk, uh, freshwater mussels. You can see the theme here. The research fellowship was undertaken from a cross-disciplinary perspective, um, combining an ecological psychology approach with digital storytelling and information science, uh, creative writing and artistic methods. Um, and I was looking at a subset of the collection uh, at the mussels from the Potomac River uh, in Washington, DC. Um, in the end, because of the, the lockdowns that started um, as I arrived in Washington, DC, um, it became um, an adaptation of a 14th century English poem. So I wrote a narrative, um, an adaptation of a poem called Pearl about the grief of a parent uh, over the loss of their baby girl. Um, and I adapted this as an epic tale of love and loss uh, uh, through the story, uh, through the National Museum's collection of freshwater mussels in the River Potom Potomac. Um, so uh, rather than an uh, epic of grief and loss for a child, um, it's a lament for the decline and loss of a whole species um, from the evidence in the collection data and the imagined perspective of freshwater mussels. So the... Uh, Pearl of the title is the central metaphor that runs through the poem. It stands for preciousness in the original and for both loss and strength in the adaptation. So mussels create these pearls which are prized by humans for their visual beauty as a defense mechanism. And historically, pearls were freshwater mussels were fished for their pearls um, and for the pearl button industry that produced buttons from their shells. From a mussel's perspective then, pearl is both a metaphor for strength and protection and one of the causes of species loss, one of the many causes, human causes of species loss. Um, the eventual aim is to develop a cooperative role-playing game that speculates on whether we can invite members of another species to set rules we can play with. And the idea is to immerse players in the phenomenal world's muscles and their conspecifics, to invite play in a milieu where rules are set by the behaviors, capac capacities, attributes, and environmental conditions of another species. So these freshwater mussels are a keystone species upon which the health of streams and rivers and their other inhabitants depend. And the original aim of the three month fellowship was to carry out collections based research and develop a set of species profiles and narratives and to produce uh, digital artwork prototypes. Uh, for this game, um, a game environment that will simulate an underwater world affected by climate change, where the muscle player character's quest is a struggle for survival through ecosystem maintenance and engineering for habitat improvement under the working title, Aquaforming the Potomac. Um, and I think I'm gonna hand over to Beth now, who's gonna speak about future Eticlab projects. Thanks, Steph. So yeah, I'm looking towards the future and um, reminiscent of when the internet welcomed archives and collections to a new multi-layered world of interconnected information. AI is also transforming what were once all too complex and expensive technologies into readily accessible tools. Complex coding skills and expensive overheads aren't any longer necessary in order to create and share virtual collections and access global audiences of classrooms and individuals 24 seven and providing the capacity to uh, sorry to annotate audiovisual materials at scale ai tech helps archives to create more detailed descriptive information about their materials more than is feasible with human annotation alone ai is opening up new potential for access and reuse by optimizing how people are able to search for and be introduced to new things, including things they didn't know they were looking for, uh, even once dormant content is being rediscovered and enjoyed. Look at Kate Bush in Stranger Things just recently. Uh, in return, in turn, this advancement in accessibility is automating enrichment of metadata in archive content. And this data uh, will be used to create virtual learning environments. These are sets of teaching and learning tools to enhance both collections and the user's learning experience. They're trained on every user that has ever visited the digital library. But these data sets will enable quick improvements to be made 
to our virtual environments based directly on our users' needs. And at Etic Lab, uh, we are utilising VLEs to inform adaptions to our online spaces. An example is Kuva, our online privacy platform. Um, so at Kuva, we host private, secure online meeting rooms. But before you enter these enclosed spaces, a user visits our VLE in the form of a virtual waiting room. And a transaction, this is a transaction that generates a real mine of information. Uh, Kuva works with clients to train the algorithms with their own content as training data. And examples include how the leaflet rack is stacked and the type of virtual information it displays. Uh, which user controls are visible inside meeting rooms and how best we can optimise conferencing settings to uh, address a diverse audience. And so it's by making innovative and creative use of the data generated by our own collection users that future spaces will be built. And this great wave of data sets will themselves populate collections. And our future challenge is in the creation of new data exploration tools. Now, despite advances in technology to collect and store data archives, organisations are still struggling to drive value from their data stores. And as a result, we're seeing a rise in demand for easy to use data exploration and data management tools that organisations, um, they help them just extract timely and actionable intelligence from their data sets. In essence, who's used learning materials, when, for how long, and to what effect is data that needs to be accessible by providers and users alike. And we can turn to another one of ethics companies to see an example of a tool set in action. So Network Praxis um, is a platform, uh, Foresight SI, um, talked us later if you'd like to have a closer look, but it's an example of a modern digital library of companies that utilizes tools to analyze their behavior, their performance, their sustainability. Proprietary reference platforms use a combination of tools and metrics based on proprietary algorithms, machine learning, graph theory, enabling tracing and classifying of digital behavior of businesses and other organizations. A Foresight SI allows clients to measure and predict, amongst other things, growth, sustainability, and propensity for innovation, both at the level of individual companies and whole sectors or geographies. And this offers a unique set of signals to support research, steer policy, consultancy, and guide investment decisions. An analysis is based on a range of uh, unique metrics, including digital maturity, innovation scoring, semantic brand analysis. All of these data points are available from a massive and continuously uh, curated data store. Again, we've taken what would once have been a passive repository and made it both more detailed, but also added the value created by actively maintaining a history of change and usage. Now, one of the first projects we undertook over a decade ago was to develop predictive analytics based upon a comprehensive list of measures of student behavior in a university. We compiled a data lake of library access information, uh, VLE usage, tutor appointments and more. And what we discovered then is perhaps even more important now. Students who use the richest and most evenly distributed mix of learning experiences perform the best. Combining staff contact with a virtual learning environment usage and a range of library accesses was predictive of success. Just as important was the realisation that sharing these data with users could be a powerful tool for enhancing their performance. And more and more of the usage data produced by systems is now available to help drive development of new services and quality of experience of users. But we're witnessing a rapid and deep rooted change. Uh, collections as a data development um, is encourage, to encourage computational use of digitized and, and born digital collections. Now, by making collections available as data, institutions work to expand the set of opportunities for engaging, knowledge sharing and collaborating. And through events like DCDC22, exchanges are encouraged, developments discovered, and multidisciplinary collaborations are formed, which in turn contribute to advances in AI. And since our foundation, uh, we've designed and implemented a variety of different technical interventions involving digital strategy, automated communications, data analytics, machine learning, in a range of fields. And our expertise runs the gamut from data science and programming 
to organisational psychology via cybersecurity and graphic design, to mention a few. But we set no predefined limits on the kinds of projects we engage with. So if you've got an idea that everyone around you keeps telling you is impossible, please do feel free to get in touch with a member of the Ethic Lab team, uh, where we're redrawing the bounds of the feasible, and it's all in a day's work. And thank you ever so much for your time, and look forward to any questions. Uh, so we'll have uh, questions um, at, at the end. Th thanks very much, Beth, um, and the team. Um, okay, so I think we'll move on to introducing the uh, the next uh, presentation. Um, I just realised that uh, I hadn't uh, described myself. Uh, I'm a middle-aged uh, white male. Um, I have uh, short cropped hair. Uh, I have quite a graying beard, I should say. Uh, I'm wearing a, a light uh, um, checked uh, shirt uh, and dark trousers. Um, so I thought I should say that. So the uh, next presentation is called On the Face of It, um, Creating Virtual Reality VR an educational outreach capability at the Rhonda Heritage Park Museum. Uh, the presenter will be Darren Macy of uh, Rhonda Kinnan Taff Heritage Services. Um, so Darren's an uh, operational manager of the Heritage and Outreach Services at Wales' uh, third largest local authority, Rhonda Kinnan uh, Taff. Um, he combines this role with the teaching portfolio at the University of South Wales, uh, his areas of research include heritage, collective memory, cultural understanding, Wales and the Atl and Atlantic activism, uh, and the power and the glory, revolution and evolution of energy policies in Wales. Um, Darren, over to you. Hi, thanks, Peter. Uh, really good Welsh pronunciation as well. I'm, I'm very impressed. Um, I have ancestors. <laughs> oh, I, I can tell, I can tell. Uh, it's a bit of a Welsh theme in this group, actually. Uh, just to describe myself as well, I, I'm uh, similarly a, a white middle, middle aged man. I've got a, a white shirt on, and I suppose ginger or auburn depends on which mood I'm in, but I, I suppose ginger uh, for those of you out there. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, a specific project, one specific project today. Shift. So it's uh, one case study. It's called, um, we produced uh, a, a VR experience called the Pulk Bar Cum Ronda. For those of you who, unlike Peter, are not fluent Welsh speakers, uh, I'll quick translation. Pulch is mine. Bach is a, a mutation of Vach, which is small, come is valley. And Ron, there obviously is where I can come from. So it's small mine in the Ronda Valley. I, I, I've got some friends up in Big Pit Museum who, who took exception to my kind of cheekily pinching their title, but uh, but I think they're over there now. So we based this on the Ronda Heritage Park in South Wales. Um, we were supported in this endeavour by the Welsh Government. We funded completely by the Welsh Government's uh, Winter Wellbeing Project, which has um, gone through right through this winter, um, began in the, kind of middle of December. We had to deliver, I'll discuss this in, in a bit more depth later on, we had to deliver by the 31st of, of March, so quite a, quite a tight time frame on that. We've, the whole experience is an outreach experience from the Welsh mining experience at the Rhonda Heritage Park Museum, which is in, in the Rhonda in Trialwood. So uh, the Winter of Wellbeing Fund was based on the idea, it, it's funded by the Welsh Government, so it was an initiative to support social, emotional, and physical well-being of children and young people. I, th I think it's a, it's a bit of a spillover from, from, from the pandemic and trying to get, get you know, children in schools back re-engaged with, with the wider community and trying to you know, uh, encourage more interaction. So uh, that, that's the basis behind it. We were lucky enough to secure a grant of uh, just approaching £50,000 for this. Um, which was really, really appreciated um, and quite, quite, it's still quite tight to deliver everything we've delivered on, on even that quite considerable uh, amount of money. So um, it, it, we kind of evolved into this project. So we began, we were involved in um, a different project called Last Voices of the Valleys or Last Voices of Mining, uh, which was um, uh, conducted by a company called Vision Fountain. And, if, if anybody wants to know any of the tech behind this, please, if, if you drop me a line, Vision Fountain are, are the tech people involved in this. I, I'm a, a source historian, so I, I'm kind of the ideas man and Vision, uh, my, my friend uh, Richard from Vision Fountain is more, more the delivery end of it. So Richard began um, conducting an oral history project with uh, in the Avon Valley and also in the Rhonda Valley with, with uh, miners. So that he was 3D mapping um, 
the, the, or created 3D portraits of miners to go alongside all history testimony. So that, from that, then there's an uh, as example there. From that, then schools were creating. He, he took that to schools, and he, the, the schools were creating um, their own images of the miners, listening to all history, and he, he picked different pieces of all history out for me because specific what we were looking for with with the oral history testimony as well. So we picked that out. You played that to schools, uh, six or seven different schools, some in, in Cardiff Bay. So I'm sure there was a diverse element to this as well. Um, some in, in the Ron Valley, some in Avon Valley as well, in Glencorog. Um, there's an example of, of some of the children involved. That's our uh, display uh, gallery in Ron Irish Park. So that, that's Triavod Primary School, which is you know, about six or seven metres from, from the mine where, where we're based. So that is the exhibition that was created from, from these, these 3D portraits and the oral history. Um, that's, that's the wonderful mayor, yes, that's, that's my plug, because this is being recorded and I'll show this back to my colleagues in RCT, that's, that's me getting some brownie points. So that's the mayor, yes, next to me. That's uh, my uh, our two of our educational outreach officers, um, Kath and, and, and Esther, who do a brilliant job. So it was, it, this is the, the initial project. So we started out with the idea of, of, of a 3D portrait linking now with an old history project and that, that, that this was all funded previously by uh, um, a national lottery grant. Um, off the back of that, we, we, were, we found out about this um, uh, Winter Wellbeing Fund. Again, I mentioned a super tight time frame. Um, I was actually informed on 15th of December, it submitted the bid by the 7th of January um, and we had to deliver by the 31st of, of March, we could, if you can imagine. You know, buying hardware, creating a completely new, uh, a new idea. I completely, you know, we, we had never come across anything, you know, uh, resembling what we were going to do and create this this virtual mine. I couldn't find anything similar at all anywhere, at, you know, across across the world. So to deliver that in, in in you know three months, I think, you know, not so much me, although we did a considerable amount of research around here from from my department, but the tech part, right? Richard delivering that was was absolutely amazing. Uh, amazing achievement. Um, you know, wh wh why, why is it really important for us to do this? So that that's, that image is actually the mine we uh, we well the mining museum around the Irish Park uh, we're at. We, we've our USP really is um, a, a guided tour by former miners. So it, it's that that idea that every single tour is completely different. So you've got a different you know, you've got six or seven different different guides who have different six or seven different experiences of of, of of being miners, and every group they go out with creates a different question, a different, a different, uh, you know, uh, um, a different, a different idea of of how that group dynamic works. You know, whether it's children or or, or adults or older people, everything's different. So the problem we are faced with is that you know um, our old our oldest guide is just approaching eighty, our youngest guide is sixty four. We're we're thirty plus years away from. The end of mining in the South Wales Valley. So, so you know, uh, with with the greatest respect and trying to be as, as delicate as possible, you know, um, our miners are re retiring and they are finite resource. So we need to come up with a strategy how to we sustain ourselves as an organisation, so how we sustain ourselves as as a museum, and how we 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 create a similar you can never replicate it, but how we create a similar experience. This pull pull combo one that it is really the first step in that direction. And I I see this expanding. I, I you know I, I'd love to talk about that in the Q and A, but I'm quite conscious I've only got 15 minutes to, to get through quite a lot. So th this is step one, really creating this VR experience. I'd say yeah, augmented reality is where we want to end up. Really, is is asking our our guides 10,000 questions each, programming it in so each you get a different response and, and trying to replicate. We what we can't replicate it, but trying to replicate it as much as possible. Um, the other thing for those of you who are not not from Wales. Uh, uh, the other, uh, I think, is a massive boost to the heritage sector in Wales is the, the new curriculum. So the new curriculum uh, uh, is the idea of, of engaging with local issues. So every school creates their own curriculum. They engage with local issues and try and uh, combine the local with the global. This offers the museum sector and the heritage sector in, in, in Wales a, you know, a wonderful opportunity. It offers us, a, you know, a big challenge as well is how we engage with schools. But again, you know, I see this as as as, as a step forward in that direction. So it, it's it's primarily this this project primarily aimed at schools, although there are outcomes in terms of 
of, of you know, uh, dementia and care homes, which, which you know, we've thought of as well, but it really is aimed at, at schools. So, so we wanted interactive elements. Uh, we wanted to contain as many learning elements as possible with, without, you know, but while still keeping, keeping things fun, which, which again was, was, was a bit of a challenge. Uh, and we, we, we targeted 10 to 13, you know, and, and that took us a while to come up with that target age group, really. We wanted enough maturity that they understood how to use the technology. And we wanted it to, to kind of engage under 30 before the pressures of GCSE and the pressures exam come on so that they, they could perhaps have a, a, a bit of a more uh, free run at this then. Um, we, you know, we also needed things to be portable, which is thankfully where we are you know, in, in terms of tech support at the moment. So everything we've used is not tethered. Um, we've used, uh, I don't know if I'm used to, I love to use uh, branded brand names here, but we used the Oculus 2, 256 gig gigabyte um, headsets, which, which give us enough capacity. And again, I'm not a tech person, but enough capacity to, to, to load that the experience completely inside the headset and also be able to add other things, you know, at the later date, hopefully. Uh, we want to make things meaningful. So we want to, again, tie things back to the curriculum. We want to make, make it a, a really useful, interesting learning experience. And we wanted it to be deliverable. You know, I mentioned, uh, you know, we, we had to write the bid for the same in, in two or three weeks over Christmas, and we had to deliver in three months, which, which you know, anybody in the sector, I understand is, is a virtual impossibility. Excuse that, that wasn't meant to pun, by the way, I do, I do apologize for that. Uh, but, but it was a real, 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 you know, labor intensive in terms of the research, in terms of, you know, we, we structured thing and, and in terms of, of, of the tech support and, you know, what Richard did in Vision Fountain was, was an amazing job. So real, some significant challenges. Um, so just to give you an idea of the, of, uh, of the schematics of, of the project. So we went for a, a drift mine. Um, sorry to get a bit technical from, from my perspective. So the, the, the museum is actually a, you know, a deep mine, so we actually you go down in a cage. We, we thought about creating a cage, um, too many problems, not deliverable. So the, the, the alternative is to have a drift mine, so a mine that where coal is quite close to the surface uh, on the side of a mountain. So you, you miners would just dig into the mountainside. Really. So you're not going down, you're going into the mountainside. Made things a lot more deliverable, So, but drift mines are not um, used in this area. So it, in some ways, you know, we have, we've had to explain that in the experience as well. Um, there's 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 a, there's a a map of our actual of of the entire experience. So um, the, the the participants would go into the lamp room, and I'll explain that in a moment. Then there would be a circular um, track around the mine with um, different experiences and different um, points of engagement. I think I think we're for nine points of engagement right throughout the mine, and then you'd finish back at the other side. Um, Quite what 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 again what Richard delivered here was fantastic. So it says view of the valley. It's actually he, he structured there and set there. As you look over that wall in in the VR experience, you can see the mine where, where the museum is. So you can see the the, the, the valley and the, you know, it's, it really is a fantastic piece of piece of innovation. It really is fantastic. And uh, why is the lamp room important? You know, again from, from from, from my own um, my, my own area of expertise, so uh, a miner would check a lamp in. He, he'd, he'd have a lamp, he'd have an individual lamp check with with his, his own particular number on. Uh, he exchange that for a lamp, so they they'd, every day they'd know exactly when the miners were down, and if they did check the lamps back in and out, so they'd know if somebody was down the left on the mine. And actually, that's 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 a lamp check from from the museum. You can see the number scratched out in uh, 1984 scratched into it. That's, when the mine closed, so that I think that's a, a little, little act of defiance there. But but again, that's something we you know, we use in the experience. That's something we engage with. That's something we we we, we try and address as well. Um. So when you're using it, the user would would enter the lamp room. They uh, they pick up um, various pieces of kit uh, and examine them. So th that's what we went for. This was a canary in, in in a box. There's different types of lamps. There, there's a miner's flask. All those are completely interactive, so they they, they use their, their handsets to pick them up. They can look at which which I think is a brilliant innovation as well because you know we we don't allow uh, people to use that without museum artifacts. So actually being able to 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 to, to identify things and to look at things and engage with them in, in a physical 
it's not really physical, but in, in, in a sort of physical sense, it's amazing. So again, all this is something Richard created or mapped out, you know, to, uh, as, as you can imagine, hours and hours and hours of, of, uh, of time. Um, actually in the core phase, so what, um, what Vision Fountain did for us, um, we've got an underground experience. Uh, the miners take people underground. You don't actually go in underground to simulation, but it's pretty realistic. So Richard went and mapped sections of the, of the of the of of our, our um, uh, museum, and created the the uh, the VR from from there. Uh, I was really specific. I didn't want to replicate what we've got. So obviously, I'm trying to protect our our product. So I didn't want people to 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 to, to think that by using the VR headset and using the, the VR mind that they be any, in any way replicating what they do if they came for, came for a, for a tour. Because obviously, you know. We're, we're an income generation. Uh, we look at income generation as well. So, so Richard mapped things out from from um, uh, from, from 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 our simulation, uh, placed in different different sections. And as yeah, I think it's nine different sections of film. Um, uh, there's also um, where, where you can see it, you you pick up a mandrel, you you tap the side of uh, the, the mine, coal falls away, uh, you, uh, and you can replace the mandrel. So it's, it, you get the, the, the simulation of actually digging coal. Um, again, you, you walk through the tunnel, so that, that's a great experience. Uh, different films in different sections. So uh, the, the first bit, we actually, uh, um, Vision Fountain put, put two uh, uh, virtual horses in there and a virtual canary. Uh, children absolutely love the idea and the horses and the interac interaction with the horses in the canary is brilliant. There's also a the little film there talking about pit ponies uh, section two, I think, I think is talking about injuries in mining. Section three is talking about a mining experience, uh, and so on and so forth. So they're actual, you know, miners reviews that oral history um, uh, accounts and supplemented that with, with some further oral history accounts to create this 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 you know pretty realistic environment. Um, there's a, 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 another idea, the schematic, uh, and again, you know, I'm not I'm not the tech person. I'm sure Richard could could uh, more than happy run uh, running through it. Um, sound again really layered. So um, so there's yeah, there's an ambient sound within within the mine. There's also um, board sounds. So uh, in terms of horses and the canary, you know we we bought sounds from from um, other tests. We're not just newly created my um, old history um, recordings. Um, we we employed an actor to give instructions as you're going through the mine. Um, the recording, Darren, yeah. Sorry, sorry, we'll, we'll have to um, draw to close. It's really oh. fascinating, but yeah, yeah sorry, if, sorry, just, sorry. If you can, sorry. you can do your best, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, sorry, sorry. So, we're probably an actor to talk about the, the artifacts. Um, lots of testing, uh, kids absolutely loved it. Sorry, I flicked through, I could go through the testing for the next 20 minutes as well. Uh, and we duplicated it in Welsh, so obviously, because we're in Wales, so we, we've got a Welsh version and English version. Uh, please come and see us if you want any more information, please email me. And I'm sorry I ran over, but I just I'm super passionate about this, and I think it is, you know, it's, it's a wonderful opportunity for us. Thanks for listening. Sorry I ran over. <laughs> no, that's fine. Uh, do you want to just say something about the testing? Just a, a, a quick summary. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I won't go through all the figures, but but, but what we found is you know, the, the, how, how quickly the children took to 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 the to, to the product. How you know when when we went through the numbers of did they did they pick up every la every artifact? Yes, you know, over ninety percent picked up every artifact. Uh, we found that, that, that the seated version was much better. A swivel chair was even better than a static chair. It was much better than, than standing and trying to, try, 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 try to go through the experience. So we, we learned up loads and loads of it. And, I, and again, I apologize for, for, for going over. I, I, I can talk. I do, I do a box. I saw it. It's very enjoyable. <laughs> There'll be plenty of time to cover things, I think, also in the questions. We can come back maybe to the testing thing again. It'll be interesting. Um, thank you very much, Darren. That was, yeah, great. Um, okay, shall we move on to the uh, the, the, the final pres presentation, which is pre-recorded. Um, it's called uh, Bridging Worlds, uh, Novel Panoramic Capture and Navigation of Collections and Existent Exhibition Spaces for Knowledge Exchange. Uh, presentation will be by Nina Perlman, Andy Hudson Smith, Jason McEwen, Leah Lovett, uh, Valerio Signorelli, uh, uh, all from uh, UCL.
Uh, so Nina uh, is head of uh, UCL, UCL Art Collections, and she has a strategic oversight of the uh, programs and partnerships that unlock the collections contemporary re relevance uh, for the benefit of researchers, students and the wider audience. Andy uh, is Professor of Digital Urban Systems and Director of uh, the UCL Centre for Advanced Spatial Analysis, CASA, uh, an interdisciplinary research institute focusing on the science of cities within the Bartlett Faculty of the Built Environment. He works with fellow CASA researchers, Leah Lovett uh, and Valerio Signorelli uh, and Jason McEwen, Finally, is the founder of uh, Cage Nova or Cagnova, uh, and is professor of um, astrostatistics and astroinformatics at the Mullard Space Science Laboratory (MSSL) at UCL. And is also a Turing Fellow at the Alan, uh, Alan Turing Institute, uh, Institute, UK's National Centre for Data Science and Artificial Intelligence (AI). Hello, I'm Nina Perlman head of UCL Art Collections. I'm delighted to present Bridging Worlds, novel panoramic capture and navigation of collections and exhibition spaces for knowledge exchange. I'm joined by my colleagues, Andy Hudson-Smith, Professor of Digital Urban Systems, Director of the Center for Advanced Spatial Analysis at UCL, in short, CASA, and Jason McEwen, UCL Professor of Astro Statistics, founder and CEO of Caganova. For the Q&A, we'll be joined by our fellow researchers, Leah Lovett and Valeria Signorelli from CASA. Technology moves fast and forward. For many of us, the pandemic has caused the boundaries between our home life, our work life and leisure to collapse. And whatever our individual exposure level to technology has been, we have all come to experience some form of a metaverse where our physical and digital worlds are blending. UCL is home to a number of different museums and exhibition spaces. Art, Egyptian archaeology, zoology. And like the neoclassical campus that houses them, which has evolved over time, UCL museums and exhibition spaces too have evolved to fulfill a wide range of functions in unusual spaces. We excel at exhibition-led inquiry that is research and object-based. This is what allows us to collaboratively create challenging and inspiring learning experiences, foster interdisciplinary thinking, invite participation and encourage initiative and much more. So the physical sites combined with facilitated, collaborative, and self-directed learning are very important to us, to our partners and to our audiences. But like many small museums, we felt the pressure to create digital experiences for our students and the communities we serve. And in the process, we discovered we had a remote audience. We understand that our audience's appetites for virtual experiences will grow and that competition for their attention is high. We recognized we needed a metaverse that can bridge worlds and that we ourselves need to gain knowledge and upskill in this area. So under the umbrella of a knowledge exchange project, funded by the Higher Education Innovation Fund, we brought together UCL Museums, Kaganova, and our colleagues in CASA to do this. I will now hand over to Andy. Nita, thank you very much. 
so there's these emerging worlds, metaverse worlds. They've been about for 10 to 15 years, but recently, of course, Facebook changed their name and the focus of the next five, 10 years is to build these virtual worlds. And museums, art collections will probably feel under pressure, but also want to be part of it. So from the Centre of Advanced Spatial Analysis point of view, we've always been keen to sort of share techniques and software and way to be part of these worlds in a lower cost way as we possibly can, because we're aware that museums may not have like a dedicated resource to build these worlds. And I personally think the world should be photorealistic. There's a tendency as, as from this slide here to them to have a slightly cartoon look. But if you're gonna do a representation of a collection, I think the photographic twin is the way forward. So there's multiple ways over the years to build these twins. One is the classic photogrammetry route. So you go in, you take hun hundreds of photographs, you maybe have a LIDAR rig, which is where you bounce light around the room, and you do a complete point cloud. And that's a fantastic capture of the space, the collection as it is now. But it's quite hard to work with. The data sets can be very large, the capturing can be true to life, but can take time. So I think there's a need to do an actual representation of space, but to get it into the metaverse with a sense of depth in a slightly different way. So traditionally, as lots of museums and art collections will have done over the last 10 years, is a panoramic capture. And that used to be, you know, taking a camera rig capturing about 120 photographs of each scene, merging them, and then to do a virtual tour, which they're okay, but it's kind of been done, and I'm not sure how many people use virtual tours on the web now. The resolution can be a little bit low, and it still has notable costs. But what if you could capture a panoramic tour that had depth? What if you could capture it in a single photograph at each point, where the resolution was high enough, and then it somehow took the panoramic view and recreated the 3D space behind it. That would give you a digital twin that you could put in the metaverse to show your collection and it's shared. But that needs someone who knows a little bit about physics. Jason. Today's manifestations of the metaverse are far from photorealistic. Photorealism, however, is essential to unlock the potential of the metaverse. At Kaganova, we're developing geometric AI to power the metaverse of the future. There is a remarkable connection between the Big Bang and the metaverse. We can look out over the night sky, over the celestial sphere, and observe the relic glow of the Big Bang called the cosmic microwave background. Since we observe this background light over the celestial sphere, we recover a 360 degree spherical image. In panoramic photography, we also acquire 360 degree spherical photos and videos. Kaganova was founded to leverage the expertise we have developed to study the Big Bang to address the current limitations of 360 degree virtual reality. The key to unlocking the potential of 360 degree photographic content is to enhance it through AI. However, standard AI techniques simply do not work with spherical 360 data. At Kaganova, we have developed geometric AI techniques for 360 data. These techniques also have close connections to physics, leveraging the mathematical machinery of astrophysics and quantum mechanics. Today's immersive experiences provide either realism or interactivity, but not at the same time. 360 degree VR provides photorealism, since it is after all based on photography. However, only the original camera viewpoint is accessible, and so such content is not interactive and you can't move about. CGI content, on the other hand, can be interactive, but it is far from photorealistic and it's very expensive and time-consuming to create. 
At Kaganova, we are enhancing 360 content through our geometric AI techniques to provide photorealism and an interactivity at the same time and at scale. Our Copernic 360 technology allows you to walk inside 360 photography and move about. Our Copernic Wilds technology, as demonstrated in the video here, builds on Copernic 360 to democratize the construction of large scale virtual worlds that you can seamlessly move through to explore. Partnerships like this project are invaluable to understand how our technologies can be de best deployed to meet the needs of users, such as in the cultural sector and beyond. Together with our colleagues in CASA and Caganova, we embarked on a journey. We conducted research on the use of immersive technologies in art and science, and innovative museum heritage education projects using VR and AR. We made many captures, explored technical and site challenges, and attempted to evaluate our student user experience of a pilot we created. We learned that knowledge exchange fuels an appetite for experimentation and innovation. We learned that knowledge exchange can lead you to unexpected places and new discoveries. From the perspective of a small museum, we gained greater understanding of our VR needs, the conditions required to meet these, and who needs to be part of the conversation. Our technology partner gained access to knowledge, sites, and people that can challenge technology and open new frontiers. And our colleagues in CASA, who are experts in all things virtual, gained access to trailblazers in technological innovation and culture. The collaboration required the efforts of many, and I'd like to thank UCL Culture Visitor Services Team, Kaganova Team, UCL Enterprise and Innovation Team, marketing consultant Fran Taylor and Angela Diacopoulou of Sphere Insights Market Research. We thank DCDC 2022 for the invitation to present, and we thank you, our audience, for your attention. Thank you very much to the uh, UCL team. Um, that was a very interesting uh, presentation. Um, okay, so if um, the uh, speakers now would like to um, put on their uh, video and uh, audio, um, we can start uh, the Q&A session. Um, some questions have come in uh, through the chat. Please, uh, you know, carry on asking questions as we go. I've prepared a few as well. Um, so hopefully we'll have an interesting uh, conversation. Okay. Um, so the, uh, the first question uh, in the um, Q&A box uh, is to uh, Stephanie. Uh, it says, it was, it was really interesting to hear about your projects. Currently doing a PhD investigation uh, on Death Watch Beatles on HMS Victory, part of which involves developing prototypes. I was wondering what your prototypes look like and whether you assess their effectiveness before developing them further. If so, how did you assess the effectiveness? Hey, yeah, um, your project sounds really interesting too. I'd like to hear more about that. Um, so um, there's a sort of short answer and a longer answer to that. Um, the short answer um, is that uh, we haven't done any prototyping on these projects yet. So the prototyping comes towards the end of the process, at the end of the research, uh, these are current projects. Um, in terms of the ISCRI, ISCRI project, we'll be prototyping uh, at the end of the summer. Um, and I suppose um, maybe Alex might want to speak more about this, but um, we'll know if it works if we get if we manage to show that we've uh, 
in, invited the birds to uh, respond. Um, how we interpret that um, is yet to be seen um, or heard. Um, in terms of the project at the Smithsonian, um, because of the lockdown, I didn't get to do all the testing that I want or you know prototyping I wanted to do there, so I didn't have access to the collections till quite late during my stay um, and to the staff. Um, so I was intending to build um, a to model a digital ontology, um, which is something that we've done in the past, but but and then and then test it. But my my initial test was going to be with members of staff um, at the museum in the format of a role playing game. So instead, I wrote a narrative um, and tested that with the people that I was working directly with. But I didn't have access to the wider staff. Um, but we have. Um, we have built ontologies before that we've tested um, in terms of modeling um, ecosystems digitally um, and asking them questions to check um, if they um, if they work. So in terms of testing things in the past um, that we know have happened, um, there's quite a long and complicated answer to that that maybe I don't wanna go too far into detail with, but if there's a following question uh, I can answer. And that should be a full a full answer, I think, um, to the question. Unless any of the other members of the team want to say anything further. Yeah. Okay, uh, shall I move on to um, next question then? Um, the question to Darren: um, How do you go about costing out the project with such a short time within such a short time frame uh, for a bid submission? Um, that's a really good question. Um, trust would, would would be the the one word I use is is we work we work with Richard. I had complete trust in him. So if he said he told me he could deliver for a, for a for, for a for a a, um, a set price, um, I went with that. I I didn't drill down into that too much. I think if I was working with another supplier, possibly I would, and I'd I'd want want to flesh things out a little bit a little bit more. Um, hardware was was is the Oculus headsets are out there. I think they're around. I think we paid around four hundred pound each. So it's a you know significant outlay, but yeah, it was just trusting Richard really, and and uh, you know he he really did deliver. And we we actually went back to Welsh government and asked asked them for more money. The extra money was we were originally going to put subtitles in Welsh subtitles, but but it, it just looked awful. It just did just completely spoil the illusion. So by having a, a standalone Welsh version, which means we had to get everything translated and use use a different actor to to do the Welsh voiceover. But I, I just think it's a, just a much better product. And also, when you're engaging with Welsh language schools, I, I, I don't think it's fair to give them a different experience than, than the English language school. So, so we went back and asked them for, I think it was an extra extra £4,000. And Welsh government were really good, really, really, really supportive. So, yeah, it, it's just trust, trusted Richard and, 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 and trying to flesh things out as much as we could. But And I think Welsh government and a, a, a significant trust in us because this 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 is such an exciting field and there's very little being done in it so i think they were excited to see what we come up with can i, can I just supplement that quickly because i had a question about that of costs and so forth what about uh, the sustainability because you talked about the organization evolving obviously as 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 things change um you know in terms of sustaining that into the future have you got any i just well, sustainability of, of, of our product. Um, yeah, I, I think this this is the first stage, and then uh, augmented reality really is, is where we'd like to go. There, there, is, there are some issues around that, and the guides are, are very protective of their their experience as well, and and they see they see any sort of recording of them as a threat, as a threat to their jobs. Even though I try to explain that they're irreplaceable, and, and you know eventually we're going to have to put something different, but it won't replace them. So it's it, it's we. We're looking at, at a wider bid uh, to to um, HLF in terms of you go past a pressure point and, and the guide a hologram of the guide would come up and you ask him a question and you know using the technology that some, some of the other panelists have described you you know they'd come back with a different answer they might be programmed with and again I'm not a techie person programmed with a thousand different answers you know it's a really time consuming assuming idea but it's the only way forward other otherwise you know you know. We're, we're not sustainable. Or, or to, just to expand on that a little bit as well, we, we look at other other avenues of sustainability. As a coal mine, as a mining museum, the idea of mining is, is toxic. 
So we're looking to, to, to kind of reinvent ourselves as, as, a, as a museum of energy. So sustainable energy production and how sustainable energy production can move things forward as well. So it, it's, and the, the VR can really help us with that. So it's, you know, it's, it's limitless, absolutely limitless. Thank you. Um, okay, so move on to a, a next question, which I think I think it's to everyone. I'm not, I'm not quite sure, but uh, there was a question about how do you deal with copyright issues surrounding the use and sharing of heritage material? Um, yeah, so I, I could, I mean, I, I was thinking about that in terms of uh, Beth's uh, yeah. uh, uh, presentation. So maybe can I start sure, there? Yeah. Thanks, Shanique. Good question. That's a that's a great question. Um, there are a, thankfully there are exceptions to copyright for heritage organisations, and if we just look at a couple of them, um, specific to what we were talking about today is uh, the debt. Uh, text to data mining exception. So a specific one for data mining, it allows electronic analysis of large amount of copyrighted works to identify patterns and other interesting information that specifically wouldn't be possible uh, through human reading. So quite relevant to what we were saying today in an actual exception by law. And another one that's quite interesting, um, again, to us and talking about um, um, heritage organisations and people that are in um, buildings, for example, historic monuments, botanical gardens, is the dedicated terminal exception. Um, so a copy of work can be made available to individual members of the public by dedicated terminal on the premises of any GLAM, so gallery, library, archive and museum. Um, also, interestingly, there's the parody, caricature and pastiche exception, which we've seen quite a lot of examples of. For example, um, um, archives of music being offered up to a celebrity DJ in order to promote the archive. You know, they're going to rework this music um, in that in that context of being reworked. That's an, another exception. Um, you, you can give public access um, to your to your collections that way. So really, really, there are um, quite a lot of, uh, more of these exceptions if you were um, to do them up. So re really, there's always um, there's always a way around these things in terms of heritage uh, material. It's just uh, making sure that we do it properly and uh, with the right ownership of the original um, materials. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Andy, could I could I ask you to say something about the copyright angle? Because I'm sure that arises in your... Uh, you can do. Uh, the interesting thing is that, you know, as a multidisciplinary lab, and you do all sorts of things, you have to sort of delegate certain bits of this. So if it's okay, I'm going to bounce the question to another delegate, which is Leah, who has been sort of helping us lead the copyright theme after that. Everybody and seems to be bouncing indeed, at the moment. <laughs> And indeed, Leah, Valerio, of how we do copyright from a panoramic capture point of view. Thank you. Leah, Valerio, uh, can, do you want to come in on that? Or can you hear me okay? Yeah, I, well, I, I can add something that is not specifically on, 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 on this project, but is also in, in general the use of uh, copyright material in, uh, in virtual reality is quite a. Uh, it, it's definitely a, a big issue because we are not just dealing with, uh, um, let's say, experiences. So within the asset, but we are using assets that uh, are connected to other big industries, for example. So we are mentioning the Oculus Quest. We are mentioning other VR assets, but the use of these uh, devices are actually sharing data with the external partners that in certain cases it could be fine in others it could create some um, issue in terms of, uh, of, uh, of privacy for example um, in terms of, of the the copyrights of uh, in, in our case in our uh, prototype it was uh, um, is the the, the uh, Plaxman gallery inside the um, UCL building so uh, we purposely we didn't um, uh, capture any so we didn't take any photos with uh, with people inside it that could create Problem in terms of privacy, and, and uh, but uh, also in terms of copyright, uh, <laughs> I don't know what, what specifically I can add then um, on uh, on 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 our project specifically. Mm, that's really that's a really uh, interesting insight, actually. So thinking about that when you're sharing data, you're sharing on 
material um, and, and, the, and the, the issues that arise from, from that. Exactly, um, because beyond yeah. the problem of the copyright. Yeah. There, uh, yeah. What? Sort of exclusion for that, just to mention, there is the incidental inclusion exclusion, a bit of a tongue twister, um, but it does help um, in situations where you are creating um, uh, uh, panoramas. There's also the freedom of pan panorama exception as well, just to make it even more complicated, but you know, it, it's starting to cover those incidental captures. The more, the more museums are seeing value in social media um, uh, examples of incidental media, then those laws are starting to change. And yeah, those are two more exceptions you, you might be able to use. <laughs> That's very interesting. The, the, uh, I mean, uh, so, so in, in terms of uh, what I'm hearing here, is there lot, there's quite a lot of complexity around this. So, you, you, you know, I'm thinking about smaller museums and smaller galleries and libraries that, uh, and archives that want to access these kinds of technologies. What are some of the, and this is a general question, I think, what do you think are some of the, uh, the barriers to uptake? Um, I particularly think when I say to the UCL, it's, that's kind of real cutting edge stuff. So how, how you know, yeah. how, does, how does that stuff, that, 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 those activities, how do they get taken up into the actual sector, your, your view or in your experience? So we've, we've worked on in this with various groups over the last 20 years or so. And it's just, they're fantastic groups to work with. Museums are amazing places, but they often don't have a dedicated digital team. And as we're moving towards the virtuality and the metaverse, you know, some of the big players out there have big funds and they're doing some fantastic work. And it's how we do sort of trickle the technology down. So actually it's easy to use. I think more importantly, it's low cost. I think it has to be rapid capture and low cost. And this is kind of what the grant was about. It was about merging museums with culture, with astrophysics, with our lab, where we're a multidisciplinary lab, and seeing how we can do things which can sort of go on, on online, can be used. And you don't have to do a PhD or have a master's de degree to actually know how to use it and know how to make it yourself. Thank you. Does anybody else want to say anything about, about that? I was thinking also a lot about user, user and I've got the testing uh, question still, uh, Darren, as well, but I mean, that, you know, involving people in, the, in these, um, you know, I was thinking when I was hearing about the communicating with octopuses, um, obviously also we want to communicate here with, with, with people and, and I'm quite keen on uh, notions of uh, people with technology and what that what the kind of uh, boundaries uh, or, or you know how can we transgress some of those boundaries as well does anybody have anything about you know in, so, engaging so, with users in when you're developing these kinds of technologies or these approaches so something we, we we are looking at we want to stretch is in, in terms of interpretation it is uh, it's fine finding a pitch on interpretation, a traditional interpretation for what is. It's either talking down to people, being part, or it seems patronising, or it seems you know, a bit too convoluted. So it's, it's it's having interactive interpretation where you can switch languages, you can switch age appropriate, you can switch content. You know, from from Spanish to, to to English to where we had a Spanish university in this week, and they try to read things in, in, in English and um, obviously Welsh, but but even. You know, it's not a problem we've got. It's because we've got the added language. All of our interpretation is duplicated, which is which is great and fantastic. And we're a big believer in the Welsh language. But wouldn't it be great if there's only one set of text and you could just switch that from Welsh to English to Spanish to German and be age appropriate? You know, that's something we're looking to develop. Just touching on the copyright thing is as long as, as, long as it's free to use, as long as you, you're not trying to generate income from it, we, we found that everything's great. But it's, if we do want to use this mind as a, as income generation, it completely changes changes the parameters. Then, so as, as long as it's free to use, we found everything everybody's pretty pretty you know, on board. Thank you. Uh, anything further on the on the sort of engaging people with with these technologies or or, or the testing of of, uh, of of I mean, you had some interesting slides, Darren, which I cut off on the, on the. Uh, you know, on the uh, the user engagement uh, piece and testing, I think that's what you you were yeah, leading I, to. Um, I, I, someone I said here that, that was, <laughs> yeah, someone said it was such a fascinating presentation and what an achievement. 
Um, could you share a little bit more about the testing and your results in particular? Was there anything that surprised you? Um, any struggles and teething problems? Uh, uh, to, to be honest, the, the easy use and, and, and the younger the, the, the people were tested with, the easier they found it to use. Obviously, because of the pandemic and you know, there's all sorts of articles out there, 350 percent take up in, in, in VR during the pandemic. And gaming, it just you know, pupils and children just just took to it amazingly quickly. And they engaged, they, they came from there talking about you know lamps and lamp checks and uh, and canaries and boxes, which which there's no way they'd be engaging with them sort of things if they hadn't done that. Um, you know, f- f- as I mentioned, find out that the, the sitting on a swivel chair is much better than standing because I know there's safety implications, but but it's just a much better experience. You know, we've t- we've we tested. Um, Lots of different age groups as well. You know that that the, the slides described from university students to to, to primary, uh, and just the differences in the engagement and differences in, in, in what they thought was, was good about the product and, and good about it, it was a really really use. And we you know we're still going on with that, and hopefully we're going to keep tweaking it. And again, you know, which is because this is brand new, we it's an ongoing process. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so we're coming to draw to a close now, but I've got questions still, I think, from uh, from Andy and from Leah. Um, so a minute each, if that's okay, and then I'll wrap up. Um, uh, yeah, it's okay. Just just a quick question back, because the Welsh mining work was just so nice, and the user testing. And I'm just interested in user testing from an age group. So we use the o- Oculus Quest, but that has a warning that it's not supposed to be used by people under 13. And I'm just interested about how people run that or do they do testing for a short period of time and therefore that's seen as okay. Because it seems if you're going on from a museum point of view, there is an age group um, limit there. If they just respond to that, Straight answers, Andy. I'm not sure. That's that's not my, not, not my forte. But but I'm sure Richard would, would have would have checked that out. And it could be time specific. And he, he you know yeah. he definitely does stuff stuff with primary primary age. So yeah, I, I'm I'm sure he. Got, I'll go back and ask that question. If I could just pick up on one thing in 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 the the Q and A. Somebody asked, are we wheelchair accessible? Completely wheelchair accessible. So anybody come come and see us. Everybody's invited. I I give you a free tour. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, Leah, did you uh, want to have the final word and then I'll have the final final word? I was, thank you so much. I was just going to add to um, the conversation around uh, user experience and testing. Um, Our, uh, the work that we've been making is accessible via both screen and VR headset. So I think there's one point which is around um, kind of multiple uh, platforms or channels for access um, is one way of kind of addressing that issue Um, and then in terms of testing we haven't quite got there yet um, but we're setting up uh, drop-in workshops so it does require a little bit of resource in terms of you know so that your guides aren't out of a (laughs) a job Darren Um, thinking about um, how that's supported within the institutional setting um, and Uh, on other projects in this kind of area in general we've also done more um, work around digital co-creation so that um, so that our end user group is involved in the process of designing and creating um, digital experiences and that again it's sort of sliding scale of of kind of just how much resource is required because that did require an awful lot of our um, time investment and um, care in terms of managing those projects but there are kind of different ways of um, involving people at all stages um, of the process. Okay, thank you.